and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and today I'm doing a two-week wrap-up of what I have been reading recently. Racism and police brutality are ongoing issues and are likely to be so for a long time. So the resources that I've been linking below relating to Black Lives Matter for the last couple of videos will be down in the description again. And today I'm going to be uh, putting this in order according to genre slash type of book and I wasn't quite finished with my romance kick at the end of May so I continue that on for the beginning of June and ended up reading five more romances. So I found Beverly Jenkins on the same Goodreads list that I found Vanessa Riley on which was a collection of books by black authors about black heroines in uh historical romances and Beverly Jenkins has written a huge backlog so I thought she might be a good place to start and the one that looked best to me was Tempest and I actually did a review of this in another video that I had thought about making but then decided not to. It was a collection of books that made me laugh so I'm just gonna edit in <laughs> what I said about it. That video may or may not come out. I didn't totally like how it turned out but the particular review of Tempest is pretty spot on so here it is. And that was Tempest by Beverly Jenkins. I didn't really expect this to be hilarious. I decided to read it because it had a description that said it was about a semi-arranged marriage where a single father was looking for a new mother for his child who is six years old and it was set in kind of the Old West. The trilogy that is the third book of is, is called Old West. And it's set in one of those Midwestern states that was, the name was repeated throughout the book, but I've forgotten it. But the point is, it had an old Western sort of feel, and the single father had put an ad in the paper, which is a circumstance that I've seen a few times now in historical fiction that I only started to see recently and I'd never seen before. Granted, I have been reading a lot more historical fiction than before just lately. But anyway, apparently people would put ads in the paper for, uh, say, they're looking for a uh, wife or a husband and then you would reply to it much like online dating now. I had no idea they had a, a version of that in the olden days. But anyway, <laughs> you put this ad in a paper and it was a fairly widespread paper and this woman saw it and decided she wanted an adventure so she would go off and marry this man who she corresponded with a few times in the paper, kind of like I guess DMing each other. They decided to meet up and so the basic premise is that it is this woman going to become the mother of this child. And I really like romances with single parents where taking care of the child's feelings and bonding with the child is just as important as bonding as the bonding between the adults. And this delivered on that. I really loved it. And the reason that it made me laugh out loud <laughs> was because this man is fairly traditional. This is set in the late 1800s and he thinks a woman's place is in the home even though he has a sister who struck out on her own and owns her own farm and she is a very forward-thinking woman and believes that women are and should be equal to men and she gives him a large number of talkings to and she smacks him down so efficiently <laughs> and he learns from his mistakes obviously if he stayed a sexist it wouldn't be a very enjoyable book. But she hilariously takes him down a peg numerous times and she also joins up with his six-year-old daughter and his 20-something year old sister uh, <laughs> and they all kind of agree against him and I enjoyed that a lot, that familial dynamic. So it was a really nice mix of hilarity and also really sweet mushy moments. So that was a really good one and was a really nice way to kick off the month and because I liked it so much I tried another book by Beverly Jenkins and my library only has about six or seven different books by her even though she's written like 40 to 50 at least. So I didn't have a huge selection to choose from but I picked Destiny Surrender which is about a sex worker who ends up pregnant accidentally and she has had chemical abortions before but she decides that she wants to keep this baby. This is still in like the 1870s somewhere in that range and so she gets kicked out of her place because she can't uh, continue to do her sex work while she is heavily pregnant. So in this book Beverly Jenkins looks a little bit at the economics of sex workers at that time and how they were very much under the thumb of their pimps. But in this case the main character is helped out by a 
old woman who works as a maid at the place where she works and there is some magic maybe magical realism um, I'm not sure the definition of that but there's a very small amount of magic where this person who works as a maid has visions of the future and she comes from a family line that has those and so the reason that she helps our main character out is because she had a vision that that was what she was supposed to do but as this is a romance the main plot is about i think her name's billy i forget main characters names with a vengeance when i'm trying to film these videos but anyway the main plot is that billy knows who the father of the baby is because the father has a distinctive birthmark and the baby also has the same birthmark in the same place and she was actually on fairly good terms with this particular customer when they used to see each other this was about a year ago because he went off and hasn't been back since but she is worried that her pimp will come after her because she had tentatively agreed to give away her baby for adoption for a fee which the pimp would be taking all of but since having the baby she doesn't want anyone to sell him anymore but doesn't feel like she can keep him safe on her own because her pimp and her pimp's son are very dangerous people so she runs off with her baby to the city where she knows the father of the child lives finds his big estate and crashes his uh what's it called engagement party she tries to do it kind of subtly so that people don't have to all know that his that this is his baby crashing this party but ultimately fails his engagement gets called off and his mother tells him that he needs to marry this girl to keep her and the baby safe whereas Billy's plan was to leave the baby with him because so that he could protect the baby while she ran away by herself but she actually liked him quite a bit when she used to know him a year or so ago and so she's not too terribly upset about the whole marrying thing except that he's a big jerk to her when she first shows up but his mom has a very strong take care of instinct as well as being very strong-willed so her will prevails and in this particular romance there is that really stupid trope that I've talked about in videos before where they think they need to have sex to consummate the marriage or it's not legal once again, as if anyone would know, but it's really just an excuse because these two people were really attracted to each other back a year ago, and they still are now, but they need this excuse because they're still both really mad at each other for how they treat each other when she first showed up. But once again, I do enjoy single parent romances a lot, as I said when I was talking about Tempest, because that whole parental to child bonding thing is involved and the two characters bond over taking care of the child and so that happened again in this book and i also really liked a lot of the side characters billy is a very tough lady and she gets along really well with other tough ladies like her husband's mother her sister-in-law and a couple of ladies from the town who she teaches how to shoot overall i didn't like this one nearly as much as tempest but it was pretty good then I kept going on my Beverly Jenkins kick and read one of the other ones my library had, which was Forbidden. One of the frustrating things is that a lot of romance authors tend to write trilogies where it's like three sisters or three f sets of friends, and my library ha will have like two of the three books from each series, and it's like, could you just pick one series and get the complete set, but no. So in this case, uh, Destiny, Surrender, and Tempest are from two separate trilogies, but Forbidden is from Tempest Trilogy. It's actually the first book in that trilogy, and it surrounds the romance of the main character of Tempest and an uncle. So unlike a lot of trilogies, this takes place about 10-15 years for the next two books, which are about two sisters who are both raised by this aunt and uncle. And in Forbidden, we have yet another very strong female lead. She is a badass. Her profession is being a cook. She has been employed recently as a washerwoman and cleaner because her hotel where she worked as a cook was taken over by extra racist people and they demoted her from cook so they could pay her less because she was black. And so she wants to move out west because she thinks that there will be more opportunities for black people there. 
she is hoping to save up enough money to buy her own restaurant but she doesn't have much money for the journey because all her savings get stolen so she ends up doing a lot of hitchhiking and eventually happens across a hostile person that she hitchhikes with and ends up stranded in the desert with just her cook stove and duffel bag this is when the hero of the book shows up uh as he is riding in his wagon, coming back from doing some business, and finds her along the side of the road, picks her up and takes her home, and nurses her back to health. This particular book looks at colorism and passing for white because the hero was the child of a slave on a, slave on a plantation, and this was a slave who was mixed race and so had quite a few white ancestors and finally when he was born he had such light skin that he was able to pass as white despite being legally black or um, in the book the word colored is used a lot because that was the terminology of the time but because this is taking place right after the Civil War our hero had the opportunity to kind of lose himself in the war and reinvent himself afterwards and be considered legally white because no one knew any differently and so he uses his legal powers and monetary powers as a official white person to benefit the black community. He owns a saloon where he employs black people and mainly has black customers because black people weren't allowed into a lot of white owned saloons, restaurants, etc. So, and where they are allowed, generally the white people wouldn't want to go. So there, it was semi-optional segregation where both races were allowed, but, but the white people wouldn't go because they didn't want to be around the black people. And he also used a lot of his capital that he would gain and invested in black businesses. And during the book, Beverly Jenkins looks at how he uses the power that he has for good while he is white passing and then how it cuts him off from the black community but he doesn't feel comfortable in the white community because it's very racist then looks at the benefits of publicly announcing that he is not white and the the back and forth on that and for a significant portion of the book the heroine does not know that the hero is passing and was born a slave so she feels this barrier and doesn't want to have a romance with a white man because a white man will not marry her and she wants a long-term relationship and so that creates a tension between them and then there's also the tension of getting married you give up your legal rights and she wants to be a businesswoman so that was a really interesting dynamic i really liked the hero he was a really nice guy and was like public publicly active and wanting to take care of all these people and the romance was rather pleasant it wasn't as stupendous as tempest but once again a good one then i was still feeling the romance so i went back to grace draven and her fantasy romances and this time i read master of crows which is about a sorcerer who has an evil super powerful force trying to use him as its avatar trying to use him to take over the world and messing with his head all the time and sometimes physically attacking him as long as he chooses not to be the avatar for this evil and so he sends to some other wizards who don't like him <laughs> because he uh is non-conformative and they're a bunch of conformers and asks them for their help fighting this evil being specifically asking them to send him a decryptor slash translator slash studier of ancient scripts to help him try to find a counter spell or a capturing spell to defeat this evil force and so the person that they send to help him find this spell and be his apprentice which is like her official job and like her unofficial job is to help with finding the spell it's kind of complicated and weird and then she has this third job where she's supposed to spy on him because they don't like him it's a bit odd but she's kind of there to learn from him and kind of there to help find the spell and various reasons but they end up liking each other because it's a romance 
but it starts off very antagonistic because he knows that these wizards don't like him and so will have sent a spy and so he's very nasty to her at first and so she's you know unhappy back to him and lots of fighting but she gets along really well with his nonverbal might be the word for it servant who uh, speaks with sign language but you can speak to him with she and this servant get along really well and so she's not friendless in this house and also the wizard has this big dog and the dog really likes her so there are lots of different relationships going on in this house or you know crumbling fortress because that's what sorcerers have and so it's all about those different forces pulling on the characters and influencing how they interact with each other and how they become reluctant allies to kind of friends to lovers and I liked it a whole lot. I liked the magic system. It reminds me of some others I've seen in a good way. Sort of classic wizardry ideas about how to do spells and how to like exchange power. It's difficult to explain, but I really liked it. And the last romance I read was Get Alive Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. And this one I got from Seiji from the Artisan Geeks list of books by black authors. And so the reason I wanted to read this one was it features a chronically ill MC with fibromyalgia and is all about her dealing with her ingrained issues uh, from previous relationships where she she became chronically ill during those friendships so they started when she was healthy and Jessica Keller and Fozard is a youtuber who is chronically ill disabled um, and makes videos on that topic and on being gay because she's lesbian and she has talked about how when you go from having a friendship when you're healthy and all the things you do together are based around things that you can do when you're healthy and then you become chronically ill a lot of times those friendships will go away and so seeing that depicted in this fiction sounded really realistic i saw some reviews that thought that that wasn't realistic but i don't think that those reviews were written by chronically ill people because apparently that's the thing that really happens because people are trash anyway it's about her getting over the hurt from those past relationships and realizing that she is lovable this way and she doesn't have to change and not everyone is going to leave. And the main male character has some issues relating to being used in the past and he had a pretty abusive and controlling past relationship and so his emotional journey is a lot of processing that and moving on to this new healthy relationship. And I really really enjoyed all of the instances of them getting to know each other and just working around her illness. So she's in, because of the fibromyalgia, she is in pain a lot of the time and sometimes it is debilitating. And the way that the heroine dealt with her illness reminded me a lot of myself and a lot of Jessica. And the way that the hero interacted with her and dealt with those issues even though he is not a huge medical person or dis disability rights activist he's just a person who didn't know much about this at all until he met her he just reacts with so much acceptance and acts like it's just another part of her like he has issues and she has issues and she does he doesn't think of her issues of being physically debilitated so much worse than any of his problems and that reminded me a lot of how Jessica's wife reacts to her illness and reminds me a lot of how I would like people <laughs> to react to my illness and the way that my mom reacts to it because I live with my parents right now and um that was very meaningful for me also a lot of times when I'm in pain I process it and uh, cope with it by imagining my chronically ill characters in my stories how <laughs> how they would deal with it and how their partners would help them out with it and that's very comforting <laughs> to me so it was also comforting to like read somebody else's characters doing that <laughs> so then at some point <laughs> I don't know what order but I read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And so this is autobiographical and it is not 
like a full autobiography or a like little section of her life or particular story it's more like vignettes from her life focusing on a particular topic mainly what it was like to grow up with her parental situation which was her parents being divorced and sending her away to live with her grandparents and that not being an ideal situation and then getting sent back to live with her mother and um, being abused there are a lot of trigger warnings for this definitely check those out before you read this and then getting shipped off to her father whose n new wife was emotionally abusive and then having struggles with other parts of her life later on and so it's about her difficulties but also about her hope through that and and it has a lot of hopefulness to it while also being about really dark subjects it was pretty short I think like the audiobook was about four hours and it was narrated really well I think there were some like background sounds going on and the narrator really gave a lot of personality to the different voices going on and it had a really lyrical quality because Maya Angelou is a poet and so now I'm currently reading some of her poems but I'm wanting to digest those slowly because they're really powerful and short and so I want to like take my time with them. Then we have Legend by Marie Lu, which I have seen this series around a few times on booktube, but the person who made me pick it up finally was Starla from Starla Reads. She was rereading the series to get ready to read a new book that had just come out, kind of like a little continuation of the series, and so it sounded interesting from what she said about it, so I checked it out and I really liked it. It is a post-apocalyptic story about some 15 year olds, so it's YA approximately, and in this case the US has been chopped in half and part of it has been absorbed by the ocean I think on both sides, but especially around LA, and the western half is where the story takes place. The east side of the country is a different country and they are fighting each other, and in this case society is separated out based on intelligence um, slash how you do on a standardized test and also uh, familial economic status. So supposedly if you score really high on this standardized test you get to go to fancy college whereas at the other end if you score uh, medium low you get to go to like grade school and nothing else and become a peon worker and then if you score even lower than that you uh, get executed um, because uh, eugenics basically also but before they execute you they like medically experiment on you for funsies and that is what happened to one of our main characters named Day and then our other main character June scored the highest possible score on this standardized test and she also came from a family that scored really high on these tests so her whole family was already pretty well off financially because when you get to to go to the college, you get a high paying job, etc, etc. So she got to go off to this fancy college and she graduated really early and so she's a really brilliant operative for the government. And so Day is a anti-government insurrectionist and <laughs> blows things up and messes with the military basically. And so she is sent to hunt him down when he supposedly kills her brother. And so it's about them doing a cat and mouse back and forth, followed by them interacting and figuring things out together um, about how things are not as they seem, as is the norm in dystopian societies. And I thought that was really interesting. I really like when the little guys fight the big guys, the government, and win, like Robin Hood. I don't like dystopians where the little guys fight the big guys and then get killed. That's depressing but this seems to be one of the other kinds of stories the hopeful stories I should probably read a summary of the next books to make sure that's true but thus far it's very optimistic and I really like the world building and trying to figure out who's in who's really in charge and why are they making the decisions that they are then we have Nevermore which is a totally weird book that doesn't fit in with the rest of these at all it's middle grade and it is kind of about a girl who goes off to magic school so very slightly harry pottery if you're now looking for an alternative to that for reasons but it's it's like a wacky 
magic school in a wacky universe, kind of like Fairyland or Furthermore. And this is one of the few cases in which I like at least one, possibly two adults in a middle grade book. So in this case, the workaround for this child being in mortal magical danger while being in the custody of a neither negligent nor jerky adult is that the bad forces that are opposed to the little girl are significantly more powerful than either her or the person having custody of her and they both have to fight against it more with cleverness than with uh, overwhelming force. So we start off hearing about the life of our main character whose name I have once again forgotten but she is about to turn 11 or 12 and she was born on some special day that comes once a year and any child that is born on that day is considered cursed in the land where she comes from because they always die on that day 11 or 12 years later. There is also a practice of blaming everything that could possibly be attributed to bad luck or just incompetence to being near the said cursed child. So it's got off, it's a very strange and uh, depressing beginning and I almost DNF'd it at 30% because most of the things that happened up to then had been pretty depressing but then she got to the magical ghoul-ish sort of place that is partly a learning center but also largely a testing center where a bunch of children go through a series of tests to see whether they are good enough for the Wondrous Society. And to be good enough for the Wondrous Society, you have to be smart and truthful and brave and also have a really cool talent. And so they're kind of difficult to pin down criteria and you can't really study for the tests. It's more about who you are than what you know or what you can do. But there is also a lot of studying and learning involved in order to try to pass these tests or trials. And there are a bunch of young learning to do magical things, people all concentrated in one place while they take these tests, along with their teachers. Each kid has their own particular mentor slash I think they're called sponsors. And so we get to see a lot of relationships between these kids develop and also between kids and their mentors. And I really enjoy that as well as being in another of these wacky magic has kind of sort of rules but also not exactly and everybody's magic works different type worlds. So I think I will be continuing that series. Oh by the way, <laughs> since this was an audiobook I want to mention that I have switched the video game that I play while I listen to audiobooks. Uh, instead of playing The Sims I am now on a Fire Emblem kick so I'm playing Fire Emblem Three Houses and enjoying myself thoroughly. Now I've jumped around a bit on my list, but I think that the last thing I have to tell you about is Storm Cursed by Patricia Briggs. So this is the 11th book, I think, in uh, her Mercy Thompson series. And so once again, this is a paranormal adventure mystery type series with werewolves, vampires, fae, uh, witches, which this one centers on witches. Usually each book centers on a different group of supernatural creatures. This one was about witches and while each has its own plot that it wraps up, they also tend to reach back to former adventures and find out that those weren't as wrapped up as we thought and like there's an overarching plot going on as well as individual ones that get wrapped up each book and so I really like that. It reminds me a lot of episodic TV shows. A lot of TV shows used to be very episodic, now there are less of them, but like the various Star Treks that came out in the 90s would have an overarching plot that would develop piece by piece through each episode, but it would also have one narrative per episode that was wrapped up at the end of every one. And I really enjoyed that because it was very satisfying and you could go to bed on a good note because I usually would watch those before going to bed. But it was just very nice to like encapsulate things and it was a really good vehicle for subplots <laughs> so and I really enjoyed the subplots especially of Star Trek more than the actual plots and in the Mercy Thompson series I enjoy both the subplots and the main plots a lot and I also really like being able to finish each book and having that be a done encapsulated thing while knowing that I have more to look forward to with the next book in the series. 
The next book, by the way, is the last book that has been published. I'm going to be really sad when I finish it, and I might just start the series over and read them all over again. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a really pleasant world to be in. It's just nice. There's so many nice, pleasant people. <laughs> I love so many of the side characters. So, once again, really enjoying that. If you decide to pick up the series, there are trigger warnings especially having to do with the third and fourth book, so look those up before you read them. But uh, that is what I've been reading in the last couple of weeks. I'd love to know what you've been reading lately, what you've been enjoying, and what you've been not enjoying. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!